Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and murder cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 68. So close to 70. So close. I like those round numbers. You do. You do. We respond well to round numbers. I do. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Enjoy me holiday. I'm oh, on we're holiday. on holiday. Yeah, I'm going to work now, though. So. <laughs> I could I've be on a sofa watching telly. I've interrupted your holiday you by have. doing this podcast that you love and that you love to do, and you can drink and listen to stories. Yeah, fine. Well, dear listeners, you're loved. Uh, well, any poisonings this week? I don't think so. No? Haven't left the house, really. Your idea of a holiday is not going to a beach or going oh, and exploring no. your it's, places. It's seeing as few people as possible. It's my <laughs> absolute perfect. Having a nice lie down. Having a nice lie down and a sit in a dark room and not having to leave my house. For five days perfect. straight. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who has been really, really lovely over the past couple of weeks. Everyone has sent us so many nice messages. You are seen, you are loved. We really, really appreciate all you beautiful people out there in the podcast community and our fans. This is the first time that we've recorded the podcast at my house for for some time, isn't it? For some time, indeed. That's why, if it sounds cavernously echoey, it's, that's, that's why. Because <laughs> I live in a cave. Because Sinead has a palatial house. High ceilings and chandeliers. <laughs> yes, and a butler. Because I live in a box. But it's a nice box. <laughs> I live in this old ramshackle mansion alone, rattling around with a dead butler. That's your husband. I know. He doesn't like his work. <laughs> well, speaking of dead butlers and huge ramshackle mansions, I think it's time for us to thank our Patreon subscribers, because that's what they pay for. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're the ones funding your dead butlers. So thank you so much to Alison Smith. To Fiendish Glee. To Ashley Rivers. To Kaya Johnson. Debs Moss. And Alexandra Rodriguez. Well, oh. hurrah. Hurrah. Lovely, sexy names this week. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you to everyone who's joined our little... Patreon family. Oh, Patreon's a wonderful, wonderful, happy place, isn't There's it? Lots of excitement going on there. Lots there of are. stories and death. Th- which is what people want. Which is what people pay for. Well, Nick, are you ready? Yeah. To drink cocktails and talk about poison. I mean, it's only, what, four in the afternoon? I think it's definitely time for a cocktail. Oh, or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails because it's the afternoon and that's more civilised. Is is poison time afternoon time? Is oh, absolutely. 4pm is poison time. Is poison, poison time. time. I'm not familiar with this tradition, I must admit. Poison time is 4pm. 6pm is cocktail hour. Right. 8pm is put them together and see what happens. Okay, I think your dead butler is telling you misleading things. <laughs> He said it was a thing. He says it's what all the fanciest people do. Well, it seems like it was a cry for help in retrospect now. But I just went with it because I wanted to be fancy. Yeah, I'll go with a cocktail. Okay, go with a cocktail. Yeah. Move all my chandeliers out of the way. Absolutely. That was another ill-advised investment. We're going to go with the first one. Great, because we can't, we can't, we can't possibly tell a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that would flavour our cocktail of the week my story this week and my pick of the ingredient and I can also already Mm, see mm, mm. Nick's disdain just creeping across the table at me because this week's secret ingredient is oysters Mm. oh yay yay Yay! How lovely. <laughs> You're mm. really upset by this, aren't you? I don't like oysters in the slightest. Why don't you like oysters? Oh, they're just slimy and... <laughs> they're not that slimy. It's not very nice. And the taste of the sea. Yeah. Which is a taste everyone wants, apparently. <laughs> I don't mind an oyster. Yeah. I don't mind an oyster. Yeah. A little bit of lemon juice in there, a little bit yeah. of vinegar. Slop down. I don't mind a cooked oyster, I have to say. See, I've never had a cooked I oyster. Don't mind, I've, I don't mind a cooked oyster, but I can, I can deal with that. It's the raw, slimy shenanigans. <laughs> Can't be doing it. <laughs> I like the raw stuff because it makes you feel great. It's all protein and the uh, sea and yay, run around, yum, 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 yum. Usually with a <laughs> vat of wine that I have with it. Oh, well, go with the wine. Well, you know what? I'm sorry. It's my story. So I say oysters. Yay. Mm. So with oysters as the ingredient and the inspiration, he, he, mm. Nick looks really annoyed. <laughs> He's like, I am done with your shit that's this is it this is the show this is the episode that's gonna break him what have you come up with Nick? well i mean uh, there are a few options there, there are. are there are and they said so the first thing that came to mind would be prairie oysters that is the first thing that sprang to mind okay have a bit of a musical theater moment now prairie oysters are brandy or cognac I think and a, cognac and a raw Egg? Cognac, yeah. Worcestershire sauce, hot sauce. Yeah, egg yolk. I could still make those. 
it's an option. It's an option. It's, it's, it's an, option. an option. Maybe we'll see how this goes. If the, if the one that well, we have fails miserably, then you you have at it. You potentially tomorrow you'll need one because they are they are meant to be like a, a pick me up, a hangover. Yeah, hangover. Cure. Cure. So I don't have a hangover at the moment, so I didn't think it would be appropriate. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, fair enough. So fair maybe enough. that's a tomorrow drink. Okay. No. But that's a backup. Always mm-hmm. good to have an emergency backup. There was another thing that someone put on social with Rocky Mountain oysters. It's not those. No. No. Oh, okay. What, what, what is, is it just eating oysters? No, they're testicles. Oh! oh what? <laughs> testicles. Oh, no, Obviously I've animals. heard of that. I've I think it's Rocky Mountain. That. Oh, God, I think I've heard of, like, bull's oysters yeah, or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Oh, testicles. It's, testicles. It's, it's, to, it's to make it sound more fancy and people aren't going to go, oh, 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 testicles. But then if people don't like oysters, they'll go, oh. <laughs> Probably more likely to choose that than a large plate of bulls. What establishment is this that thought they would dress it up because the clientele they were getting in up the well, mountain were all it? coming in in ball gowns going, any oysters in? No. Oh, wow. Oh, they yeah. wouldn't be fooled by a plate of but there, is testicles. Is any different to any other sort of offerly things? <laughs> I don't know. I've never had. I've never uh, so tasted no, neither have I. Neither have I, to be honest. This could lead to a number of jokes. Yes, indeed. So, <laughs> so it's not those. Ah, balls. Um, so going off on a slight... No, not, I'm not going to say a tangent. Mm. But we're going, on a, we're going oyster adjacent. Oyster adjacent? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now who's throwing the evil eyes? Because <laughs> if you dodged oysters by going, oysters, they begin with O. Ooh, let's look at olives. <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite that, that far right, adjacent. Right, oyster adjacent. So this, right. this week we have, we are having, we're having a French pearl. Oh, for God's sake. What? God, as soon as you, like a nanosecond before you said it, going, oh God, he's going to go for pearl, isn't he? He's going to go for pearl rather than have anything oyster related. <laughs> oh, very clever. Yes, very I clever. thought so. I thought, ah, that gets me out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're still going to have prairie oysters at the end of you this. You can have that. I am not. <laughs> we can film it. Because I will vomit all over your house. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small price to pay. My huge cavernous house. There's a vomiting room. You can go yeah, into well, it. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> the dead butler. It'll be lovely. Something for him to do. <laughs> okay, then. So a French pearl. French pearl. Oh. Better be served with oysters. Right. There, well, I say there was one that which was quite intriguing, which was a St. Petersburg Martini. Yes, I think I saw that which one. Which is a vermouth, but infused with oyster shells. Yeah, see, we could have done that. It's I good. thought you might have done that. I was going to, but then, because <laughs> I, I, I even contacted uh, the local fishmonger Yay. and said, do you have any oyster shells? And they said no. Oh, really? Mm. Bastards. So then I thought, well, I can't be asked to drive to the seaside. Um, I mean, Whitstable, which is 10 minutes away. Yeah, well, without a car, it's longer to drive. Uh, yeah, it's very hard to drive <laughs> without a car, yeah. It's damn near impossible, <laughs> even. Oh no, you could have just hiked there with a, with a burlap sack and a come stick. back with your oysters, singing a song about oysters and sacks. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like a fun journey, doesn't, actually, doesn't, now yeah. I've said it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I didn't go for that option either. But that, uh, well, that was an intriguing one. I'm really intrigued by that. If I ever get oysters, we'll make that. So yeah, so if we ha- buy some oysters... And save the shells, and we'll give that one a go. We're going to have a French pearl. Sounds yeah. delightfully elegant. Oh, I should well, hope so. <laughs> so I think it's time for us to go into the poisoner's cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. See you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, a French pearl. Pearl. Yes. Ooh, now it looks green it and does. fresh and citrusy. And if there's fucking green chartreuse in this, I'll kill <laughs> and you. And French. <laughs> what? And Wait. French and green and, and French lovely. Wait, what? Wait. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it's only just occurred to me that th- that might be in it. <laughs> It's, oh, I was so excited about this. I've been wanting a citrusy drink. I've been, I've been wanting citrusy drink. And you might have one. I gave you oysters and you thought, I'll show that bitch. Pretty much. <laughs> okay, so it looks lovely and refreshing, but now I'm frightened because I've suddenly just put together French what, chartreuse, green chartreuse. What if it's in there? But you're not going to tell me what's I'm in not, it, are no. you? No, I'm going to taste it first. Yeah, absolutely. You know okay. how this works. Oh, good God. All right. Well, it looks very exciting. A French pearl, elegant. I have high hopes. Let's dive in and have a taste. Indeed. Merry okay. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, I quite like that. Yeah, you would. <laughs> There's not. <laughs> huh? There's not. <laughs> There's something else in there, though. Oh, my God. Is there absinthe in it? There is absinthe in it. absinthe in it. Oh, I was throwing. There was definitely something in there that was like, oh, that's weird. And I was like, is this chartreuse? I don't know. I don't... Oh, no, it's absinthe. Oh, absinthe drink. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I sure, sure. That's one of, that's the favorite, my favorite absinthe drink we've had. Instantly a favorite. Yeah. Oh, my God. All right. Second sip, second sip. Oh, oh, I can go with that. You really like that, I, yeah, don't you? I do. I'm really surprised. It's absinthe. <laughs> I generally, I'm not a fan of absinthe. I find it far too overpowering. Mm. Um, but that is, ooh, that's nice. <laughs> We've got Nick's happy place. Absolutely. Yay for Nick. <laughs> I am. Um, we'll give it here then. <laughs> <laughs> I've 
never seen Nick like this, actually. He's just like, no, this is mine, and this is what the day is going to be. I, I, you can finish it if you want in a bit, because I'm actually frightened if I don't give it to you now. It's got all the components of things I should like in there, because I feel like there's lime in there and mint, because I know there's mint in there, because you took it from my garden. <laughs> so, yeah. What else could be... So, absinthe, lime, and mint. Yep. Um, I'm assuming there's something else. Gin? There is, and gin. And gin. Is yep, that it? That's it. Oh, Wow. Ooh, do I like it though? I am going to say the absinthe is pretty strong in there <laughs> and the flavour is overpowering. I, I don't think it is. Oh, there's sugar syrup as well. Sugar syrup, There's yeah. sugar in there as well. Um, I don't think the absinthe is overpowering. Maybe it's just personally. me. Personally, because there's a few drinks where I've had where it has been overpowering and yeah. it's just unpleasant. I find it unpleasantly so. Well, for me, it is works really well so what's the quantity of absinthe in here i mean there's a quarter of an ounce quarter of a oh, it's tiny, that. so it? it's a tiny amount but it yeah. is a very 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 strong flavor yes so it's, it's the smallest amount that's why a lot of times you just have an absinthe rinse on a glass because it is that it's that strong it's been quite a while since we've had an, an absinthe cocktail yeah. um the absinthe episodes generally descend into madness because <laughs> uh, it does send us insane some of the other absinthe cocktails i don't know i I feel like I probably said this every time. It's been so long. I think we've had some that I quite liked. Well, we Maybe had the, we had the Corpse the, Reviver. That was an absolute one. The Corpse Reviver um, is a lot of fun. Yes. Because it's just insanely massive. <laughs> uh, what else? Arsenic and Old Lace. That's another one we've, we've had with them. Yeah, that was only okay. Which is like, Nip. I shouldn't have had the bottle of wine that I'd had before <laughs> drinking that. Again, in the afternoon, yeah. Well, if you're into your absinthe, you're into your sort of aniseedy drinks then this is everything else with it is lovely the components are there i'm gonna have another sip i don't know <laughs> just the absinthe is really strong it's really i why is it so overpowering for me at the moment because i've con i've come to quite like ouzos and things like that I used to hate them i know it's not the same but yeah. <laughs> i've come to quite like alcohol and this is an alcohol this is true i mean so you're bound to that how could you not like it i know i am feeling like it's a little too strong on the absinthe for me but uh it's a hell of a drink i'm not gonna not drink it because i don't like it but i kind of feel like i want to give it to you <laughs> and make myself a simple gin and tonic so you've now got two of the delicious drinks because i've never seen you reach for like in your eyes like no give it here give it here i'll have it i'll have it i'm donating my cocktail to you i think it's only fair because you really love it and i don't think i should force it down if i'm only okay with it when you'd be sitting there like puss in boots with the wide eyes like i want that i like that give it to me well nick with his two french pearls in hand sounds a little bit like it's a euphemism for you walking down the street with two prostitutes in the 1800s <laughs> yeah absolutely which is quite apt for the story actually is it oh, okay I'm yeah there we are. yeah and and me training behind with my gin and tonic trying to be one of the cool kids <laughs> but you know failing miserably are you ready for a story nick go on then hooray 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 so this is Oh, this is a good story. This is a big one. Again, one never heard of. Someone suggested it. Looked at that. The internet exploded as soon as I typed <laughs> it in and was like, oh, ho, ho. but first I'm going to, I'm going to set the scene for you, Nick. I'm going to okay. set the scene for you, Nick. Nick, it is summer. Yeah. On 1860. The, on the plains of America. It's in New York City. Oh, so close. So close. The <laughs> plains are nearby. They're out there. And as day breaks over the city's ever busy port, a chilling sight emerges out of the gloom and the mists. A small sloop drifts listlessly in the water. Not a soul on board. Now this is a troubling sight. A loose boat is dangerous enough in a busy port. Oh, but where has this vessel come from and why is it unmanned? So the authorities row out to the ship. Rowing, rowing, rowing. <laughs> Climbing aboard, they hear not a sound. They sound, see that sound, the sound, sound. <laughs> no, they don't hear a sound. Okay, sorry. Shh, not a sound. And they see that the ship's deck is covered in blood. That's going to be upsetting. Fresh blood. Oh. And searching through the cabins, they find no trace of the crew, only more blood and rifled belongings. And as they further search the deck, they discover, near the handrail, four severed fingers and a mm. severed thumb. Well, that would always be disturbing. Are there great crates of earth as well? <laughs> in, in the hold by any chance they just look over the side going, it says the demeter on here should we be worried no no crates of earth Abu. just blood everywhere a severed severed digits and the headlines would read ghost ship horror murder sloop the city is gripped by this gruesome mystery from the well-to-do neighborhoods to the dockyard slums but what has happened aboard the ea johnson well, well, I don't know. Should I tell you? <laughs> yes, I think you should. Well, we shall find out today as we tell the tale of none other than Albert Hicks. The last man to be publicly hanged in New York City. Also, perhaps the city's last pirate. Nice. And some say the Big Apple's first gangster. 
Yeah. yeah. If I say the words pirate and gangster both in the same breath, you're probably having a lot of confusing images going through your mind. <laughs> big old gangster pirates. Yeah, pretty much. Big old gangster pirates. Uh, the outfit's insane. You're probably confused and aroused. I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> You hear the word pirate, you think of the swashbuckling era of life upon the seas, big shirts, fabulous earrings, and even bigger hats. Well, we're not in that era. Boo. No. And you say the word gangster, and you might picture a group of wise guys sauntering <laughs> into the 1950s bar or a casino, ready for a sit-down with Mickey the Fish, and also wearing fabulous hats. But well, we're not there either. Hat is a continuing theme. Well, I think they both wear great hats. Yeah, absolutely. This is the tale of Albert Hicks, and it has the best of both worlds. And it also has a fabulous hat. Marvellous. So New York City in the 1800s, not quite the metropolis we know it today. Shockingly, it is certainly one of the busiest spots in the country. Jumped from about 96,000 people in 1810 to over a million by 1860. So it's growing fast. That's big, yeah. So it's a city of immigrants, gangs, government fights for control, riots, fires, growth, collapse, growth again. <laughs> So we are full-on Gangs of New York territory. Have you seen Gangs of New York, the Mark Scorsese film? I have film? seen Gangs of New York. Oh, I do love that film. Are there rabbits all over the place? There are. There were no rabbits in that film. Only dead rabbits. Only dead rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no rabbits in this. No, oh, that's boo. fine. This is the time of the fabled five points where crime was rife and a murder happened every night. That is not an exaggeration. I can imagine not. In one tenement on Cross Street, they reported a murder every night for 15 years. Nice. It went well. It's good to have consistency. Exactly. When you're looking on right move, you know where you stand. <laughs> if you're going to stay here, what's the what's the benefit? Well, you could get killed every night, fingers crossed, I'm breaking record. <laughs> the waterfront is equally grim, yet, yes, it's one of the most prosperous ports in all of the country, but it is also packed with pirate saloons, cramped slum accommodation and thieves and people who had crossed the wrong people in turn swung from gibbet. And yes, pirate is anyone who is basically committing crime on the high seas or the river. Or the river. Small seas, big seas, big any seas. of those. We've had some river pirates before. We have had river pirates. Yeah. But these are kind of sea pirates. Bigger hats. And port pirates, yes. Oh, no, fabulous <laughs> hats. That was mainly what they were after the whole yeah, time. Absolutely. It was a quest to find bigger hats. It's it's quite quite the place, New York City. Crime is um, rife, shall we say. There's also a lot of music and dancing around this time well, as well. Well, how could you refuse that? Which is, so it's not all bad. <laughs> but these are the neighbourhoods that would end up being the stalking ground of Albert Hicks when he was ashore. So Albert Hicks was born in 1820 in Rhode Island. His father was a farmer who had seven sons. He was the second son, so he wasn't the seventh son of a seventh son. That would have been quite cool, but... Yeah. But his father wasn't the seventh son. Not that I could find. <laughs> so he had seven sons, therefore he must have been a seventh son as well. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but Albert was only the second son, yeah. so none of this so makes sense. So his brother sense. did amazing stuff, but we're not going to cover that. <laughs> <laughs> now his childhood, th there was one, there was one. Well done, well done. We do have a few details about his childhood. Uh, he was not a calm and gentle child, so shall we say. He did a benefit from a good education because he didn't go to school. Much happier on the streets, fighting, pickpocketing, generally getting into trouble. This continues into his teens. He runs away from home repeatedly and eventually is arrested in Connecticut for all sorts of misdemeanors and is jailed. Now this time in jail, well jail time shouldn't be a happy time really. <laughs> This is not good time for, for Albert Hicks. He is a young man, teenager, 15, 16 years old, and he is thrown into an adult prison. That is going to be pretty horrible. He yeah. did suffer pretty terribly in prison by his later accounts, he would say. He wouldn't have had much protection. He tried to escape at least twice, would be put back in, his sentence would be extended, and he would eventually spend one year in solitary. That is going to... Well, it keeps you away from the other people who are trying to beat you up or shag you. It does. It also will send you crazy. Albert did say he, he went crazy while in solitary, and it was there that he swore vengeance on the rest of the human race. <laughs> okay. You're like, it's great. I'm You, you would love solitary confinement, would. wouldn't you? Fucking awesome. I mean, you swear vengeance on the human race most oh, um, days. Oh, absolutely. When I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> when you thought you weren't going to get that second cocktail, I will swear a vengeance upon your soul. Oh, I've got a lot of vengeance going. <laughs> well, when he was freed from jail, it's fair to say he was not reformed. But far from being broken visibly, and being a deranged crazy man, he was in fairly high spirits. A natural raconteur, charming, very attractive, as many people commented on. He seemed quietly comfortable committing to a life of crime. Once he was freed from jail, he decided that his fortune would be made on the high seas. So Fair he enough. joins a whaling ship to sail the world. And he would travel the world. And it's while on the whaling ship, he learns not to be a good sailor or to whale. <laughs> no, he learns how to mutiny. Nice. Good life skills. Perfects this art and he spends his life 
or certainly the next many, many years, just going from ship to ship, whether it's whaling ships, legitimate trade ships, anything that's got any money aboard or any goods that he can pilfer, he will join these ships, sort of inspire the crew. Hmm, we should mu- we should mutiny. We should mutiny and take all this shit for ourselves and kill everyone else on board. That's a bit much. No, we'll give it, we'll just give it a go. He does this. This is his career. And, and while he's on these ships, he sails to South America, to Mexico, Hawaii, Tahiti. He goes to California at the time of the gold rush. He is boarding these ships and then jumping off, constantly wanting to move, get the cash, spend it, move on to the next thing. He would always return home to New York, where he had now made his home. Sometimes he worked with an accomplice, other times he worked alone, but the aim for him when he was getting the cash was to spend it. And of course, he spent it on very wise investments. I'm like, sure I have no doubt. Exactly. Like booze. Yep. Prostitutes. Wise. wise. And fabulous outfits. Excellent. He re- Two out of three ain't bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You would just go for the hookers and the clothes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Booze and clothes, hookers. Go. Yeah. Your French pearls would be rejected. <laughs> as well as loving a drink, loving a fight, and loving a, some company. <laughs> he was so stylish. This was the thing that would be his legacy. Incredibly stylish man, wanting to look the best when he strolled into the bars after a hard day of pirating. Well, going to make an effort. He does. Now, he didn't go in with the big sort of pantaloons and the big feathery hat, unfortunately. So last season. So last season. <laughs> now, he was known to wear a pea coat. That is also called a monkey jacket. Yeah. Yeah. It made it quite the fashion statement later on. His little pea coat, he had this sort of uh, stylish hat slanted over one eye nice. in this very dashing way. And he would turn up the collar of his jacket or his shirt and just be sort of, oh, yeah, look at me coming into the bar. <laughs> very, very stylish. Excellent. And this was a look that people said was later copied by gangsters, mm. that people having the fedora just tilted over one eye but yes the cut of his suits he wanted to spend on silk shirts on really good trousers and shoes he wanted to look the business and when he was had his cash he didn't squirrel it away or be subtle about it he was in the bars he was drinking he was buying everyone drinks he was showing them his fabulous outfits look at me i'm beautiful (laughs) so in this respect he did carve out a bit of a reputation for himself a bit of a name as a successful pirate pirate would be the word you use then because gangster wasn't the word in operation a pirate was the same thing but on the seas and then gangster came and it was like oh you're on that yeah that's what that was the, what the committee said, decided right, okay. when they were writing the dictionary. That's what they put in <laughs> gangster. Oh, uh, you're not a sea. You're a, you're a land. Pirate oh. on land. <laughs> pirate on land. <laughs> pirate without boat. <laughs> Landlocked pirates. Yes. But it would be his involvement in that horrifying ghost ship incident that would catapult him to fame. So now it is in 1860, and Hicks is 40. He is settled back in New York City. He now has a wife and a child. Reportedly, the wife knows nothing about his criminal ways. That has passed. Some writers would say that it is a bit of a classic gangster story where this part of his life, he might have been trying to go straight or have a degree of respectability. He did really care about his wife and his child and he wanted to provide for them. He wanted to put all this behind him. Some people romanticise it a bit like that. And he but he would later say about how important his, his wife and child were. But children, they cost money. They're mm-hmm. expensive. Children require food and clothing and heat and light. So yes, he's going to need to have <laughs> and money. Light. Heat and light. And yes, light. both is preferable. Because they're like plants. <laughs> To put them on the window so then they grow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, technically. But also you need to light the apartment. It could be hot in there, but you're stumbling around in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that fun? I know, I've never heard of that. Oh, I, oh, I've run out of light this month. Let's put some more money in the light meter. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how it works. <laughs> but then you're in a tenement and you're going to need to pay for the gas lamps if they have them or fire or lamps or wicks or go and matches. outside. <laughs> Just go outside. <laughs> Open in the, the curtains. Ni- in the night time, it's famously dark. That's the thing. <laughs> you have to be able to see to get to the baby to give it all the other things it needs. Right. Yep, so those those boxes of light, they don't come cheap. He needs to pay the light man. He is a cruel and harsh master. Maybe it's one last score. Or maybe he's just like, well, let's get some money. Maybe this is just going to be one in a long series of crimes he's going to keep committing. But in the romanticised view, it's a bit of, he's going to go out and get one last score and provide for his family. So what does he do? He thinks, hmm, hmm, I'll go down to docks. Down to docks, see if I can find a little bit of work. See if I can earn some money. Earn some money down the docks. (laughs) 
Well, when he says this in the taverns, it's very quickly misconstrued. <laughs> Perhaps that's exactly what he meant. Exactly. He but then... fabulous hats. <laughs> so he's got sixpence. <laughs> that didn't work out. Apparently he was rubbish. <laughs> that was enough for the light, but he has to pay for the hats now. Um, yeah, well, indeed. There we are. But as he's trying to find a legitimate work down the docks, he thinks maybe a bit of work aboard a boat might uh, might be the thing I'm after. Sure enough, Hicks is swiftly hired to serve as a deckhand on the E.A. Johnson. An oyster sloop. <laughs> da, da, da. Do they take in pearls as well? Let's say yes. Good. Let's say the entire boat was decked out, was was decorated with yeah. pearls, with mother of pearl inlay. Absolutely, I can imagine that being like one of the, like the the kings and queens, the pearly kings and queens, the boat for them, <laughs> all covered in buttons and bling. Yes, straight from the East End. Yeah, they were going to sail to Virginia to get the oysters. They're not. Uh, I was about to say hunting for oysters. <laughs> <laughs> they were there with their harpoons. <laughs> But it was an old whaling ship, so they like, converted to oyster hunting. Steve, I know you're all about the nets. Listen to me just for five minutes here. We've got this harpoon. I cannot stress how bad an idea this is. One thing, they need to stay intact. <laughs> no, but if we grind up the shells, we'll make martinis. <laughs> On a harpoon, you could get like, oh, at least probably like ten oysters in a row. <laughs> like a kebab. <laughs> just turning them over. <laughs> Perfect. That's why they needed Hicks on there. <laughs> the captain was like, we've fired so many people. <laughs> we can't get any oysters. No, they're not. <laughs> You've got to stop trying to say hunting oysters. They're not going to dredge for oysters. They have cash. They're going to go to Virginia, pick up the oysters, bring them back, sell them, bada bing, bada boom, big profit. Albert has picked this vessel well because he hasn't just gone out to any old ship and just gone, oh, okay, mutiny, mutiny. He's, he's spent his time thinking, right, they have a substantial amount of cash on board. Oh, yeah. It's a sloop. It's a sloop small vessel small and speedy the crew are but three other men captain george burr and half brothers oliver and smith watts one of the first names is smith Smith, i like it smith watts smith watts oliver watts and captain burr hicks goes under a false name of johnson it sets sail at sunset and romantic how very romantic it's not far it's not gotten far out of new york it's in the lower bay of New York City where night has fallen Captain Burr goes yep I'm turning in for the night we'll just sail you keep watch it's fine Oliver Watts goes to sleep as well and so does Hicks goes to the quarters Smith Watts remains on deck for night duty life on the open sea um, not far from New York. Yeah. New York is just there. <laughs> Life on the open sea in the harbour. <laughs> yeah, it's not far from Staten Island at this point. Yes, they have not so, gotten far. Yes, um, not quite the open sea. Not, not quite to the those open fertile sea. oyster hunting ground. They haven't encountered any sea monsters yet. The little sloop is bobbing along, maybe by the light of the moon. <laughs> Smith is standing by the wheel, turns around, and Hicks is standing there. Polishing his harpoon. <laughs> that sounds wrong. <laughs> <laughs> We're all alone, it's the moonlight. <laughs> uh, can I have a go on the wheel? <laughs> Smith's like, uh, okay. And then Hicks goes, look over there! Smith goes, what, what, where, where, where? That thing over there, what thing? I can't see anything, look over there! And as Smith turns for the second time to see what Hicks is shouting and pointing at, out comes Hicks's sea axe and promptly smashes down on the back of Smith's head. Nice. Da, da, da. I want to know what the difference is between a sea axe and a regular axe. There is something different. I'm, well, I'm sure there is. So a sea axe is the actual emblem of Essex County flag, and it is like a. It's almost like a scimitar. Okay, it's not axe like at all. No, That's it doesn't look like <laughs> it doesn't look like an axe. It, uh, all I That's can describe it. I don't. I'm not an expert on sea axes. Well, well, you should be. I do know it is on the emblem of the Essex County flag. It looks a bit like a scimitar rather than a wood axe. No. There you go. There you mm. go. Thought there was nothing. No link there. Mm. Mm. Takes the sea axe, smashes it down, back of Smith's head. One down. <laughs> now, obviously, this makes a little bit of noise. One, well, yes. Yes. Oliver Watts, who has been sleeping below deck, wakes up and thinks, what's going on here? Sounds like trouble on deck. I'd better stick <laughs> my head out of the hatch and see what's <laughs> happening. Yeah, that can never go wrong. <laughs> and sure enough, he pokes his head out of the hole. Hicks swings the axe and cuts his head off completely. Nice. The head tumbles across the deck, spraying him with blood. The body falls back through the hatch and collapses, and that's what wakes Captain Burr up. I don't know if he's in the room or anything, but he's like, ah, there's a body. A headless body falls down. It's going to get your attention. Exactly. Two men 
down. So now Hicks is coming for the captain. He's coming for the captain, but the captain has been woken up by the falling bodies and the spraying of blood. So he is a strong man. He's capable and a fight ensues between him and Hicks. The captain jumps on him. He's close to strangling him, almost overpowers him, but Hicks manages to raise the sea axe up and strike him in the face. Yeah, that'll do it. And he literally cuts half his face off. Nice. Mm. Yeah, that'll 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 smart. This is a gross bit, but it said that his eye and his nose were hanging on the sea axe. <laughs> nice. I mean, you would remark on that if that happened. You'd be like, oh, oh, yeah, no. oh look, it's your face. <laughs> <laughs> his nose comes right off. So yes, he's killed everybody. Ha ha ha. So he goes about looting the ship, getting all of the money that he can get his hands on. He goes through each of the person's belongings as well, whatever he can get to make a profit. Back up on deck he goes, but he is greeted by what he thinks is an apparition, a ghost-like figure stumbling towards him. Maybe his terrible ways have caught up with him. The devil wants paying. <laughs> no, it's Smith. Smith wasn't actually dead. No. He's coming for him. He's delirious. He's trying to get at Hicks. Hicks overpowers him, hurls him over the side of the deck. Smith manages to grab onto the handrail mm. as he's going, and down comes the sea axe, and his fingers are severed. And Smith slips down into the water, down to Davy Jones. <laughs> Like this pirate lingo. I'm yeah, absolutely. It's very good. Hicks throws the other bodies into the water along mm. with the weapon. He disposes of whatever evidence he can. He doesn't clear up the blood. No point. It's fine. Just get rid of the bodies. Before he left the vessel, he bored holes into the keel so that it would sink. That'll do it. He jumps into the boat's rowboat dinghy equivalent yep. with all of his goods and he sails off and he manages to land on Staten Island by dawn. Shoves the boat into the reeds, gets his big bag of swag and <laughs> hightails it back off to Manhattan to go home. He's made about $230, which is nothing to be sniffed at at the time. Yeah, He's also stolen a watch and some clothes from the men because he can't pass up good oh, fashion. Absolutely. Safely ashore. He is going to go home but there's nothing to stop him stopping in some saloons on the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Make the most of it. You've had a good evening out. You've got some cash on your belt. Hicks genuinely believed that he wasn't going to be caught because there wasn't a lot you could convict a man on if you didn't catch him at the scene yeah. of the crime. You know, how are you going to piece together the evidence? Oh, it's all circumstantial. As long as he's not there when they find the bodies. He's like, well, you can't prove it. He's used a false name. He's been wily. He's escaped the law for two decades he's gonna be fine so a few drinks on him i don't know if he's covered in blood by this stage as well he's still <laughs> he, walking well, in. i mean uh, you, he probably would have had a change of clothes with him probably several changes of clothes um, a d different outfit different for killing outfit. yeah killing outfit rowing outfit yeah. traveling to manhattan outfit going yeah. into the saloon outfit so i mean he's yeah he's you don't know good. the dress code of the saloon yeah you don't know if it's farmer chic or if you need it as kind of <laughs> cocktail attire he needs a new pea coat or anything yeah. so i'm sure he was well prepared but very confident in his journey but this little dalliance would, of course, prove to be his last. Of course, the E.A. Johnson would not sink. While drifting in the water, it was actually struck by a schooner that was manned. And they remarked on, OK, that's just terrifying. This ghost ship covered in blood just going by. OK, I, I repent my sins. And the grim boat was spotted as day breaks as it's drifted back into sight. And the horror of what happened was revealed. So the authorities have to investigate. The vessel hadn't sunk. The police were able to comb through what evidence there was to check the names of the crew members to see if there was anything that they could do to solve the crime. Now, they did find the rowboat. Hicks didn't think that they would find it, but um. a, a young boy in the area found the boat, alerted the authorities, because this is huge news now. I am no doubt. When the ghost ship is discovered, all those headlines are splashed across the papers. Loads of the neighbourhoods are interested in it. Everyone wants to know what happened aboard this ship. So people are lining up to give information. So when they find the rowboat, they find it stuffed in the reeds of Staten Island. Then they can start asking questions of anyone who lives between that point and Manhattan. Pattern. So they go, okay, we've got a vague idea of where this person has gone. So they go door knocking mm -hmm. around the area. Have you seen anyone suspicious? <laughs> anyone covered in blood? Then people say, yes, they have seen quite a dashing man with a huge cargo bag on his back walking towards the Staten Island ferry. And people had seen him in the bars near the ferry dock, buying drinks for everyone, talking about how much <laughs> money he had, showing off his money, getting someone to help him count the money in the bar. Nice. Why? So Stupid confident. man. So Hicks's arrogance had let him down. They eventually find his Manhattan lodgings, and thanks to tip-offs from people who had seen him, seen him come back, and had heard about the huge amounts of money that he kept shouting about. <laughs> they're able to go through his things. They find more evidence linking him to the ship, including the captain's watch 
which he'd taken. And another piece of foolish loot is he'd taken a photograph, an early version of a photograph, of one of the men's girlfriends that he had on him. He took that. Why? Fool. Well, maybe he thought that the frame or whatever it was held in would be worth money. But not only has he got this random picture of a girl he's not linked to in his possession, the girlfriend had a matching photograph Nah. of her bow and so she could say yes that's my picture this person has taken it i even had a lock of his hair in mm. her picture and they could match that to the hair that was on the boat not through dna but just yeah, by kind of going same. yeah it looks oh, a bit it's the same color, it's, the same color. <laughs> same, it's hair eventually the police track him down and his wife and child to a boarding house in rhode island where they capture him in his bed during the night uh... hicks doesn't put up a fight he went along quietly and he is charged with murder as you can imagine, the trial is quite the sensation. I'm sure it was. Oh, it's the highlight of the season. <laughs> Even though it really wasn't much of a trial. No. No. Yeah. It's a bit cut and dry, really, isn't it? You've not too much to the defence on that one, I feel. No, the evidence is very much mounted up against him. Yeah. The, ev- the defence are just a bit like, uh, well, he didn't, maybe, I, what? <laughs> There's a lot of that going on. Hicks himself was said to sit smugly, even laughing at points, and didn't seem phased by the activity at all. Various letters are read out in court, attesting to what a horrible character and person Hicks <laughs> is. Maybe the most damning letter was read out from one of his brothers, Ooh, who harsh. utterly condemned his actions. He, uh, in his letter, he wrote, "I see the ghosts of Captain Burr and the two Watts boys arise from their watery beds and point to him as the unmistakable cause." Bit dramatic. And when I contemplate the anguish and suffering of the friends of these murdered men, all my finer feelings vanish, and I sincerely hope that he will never escape through the weaknesses of the law. Well, the thing is, he was the seventh son of the seventh son. So oh, yeah. he, he was like throwing, <laughs> yeah, he needs to throw the distraction onto his own brother from all his wizardy evil ways. <laughs> so it's like... There's a longer version of that brother's letter. And again in it where he's, you really do feel like he's going, oh, it's awful. I think it's terrible. And it's just a tragedy. And he mentions in the letter his wife and child and he writes to the words to the effect of it's awful that they have been left destitute i would definitely look after them if only i had the means and i can definitely prove that i don't have the means but oh no (laughs) boo-hoo for them he's a bit of a dick the brother very much purposely saying i'm not going to support them legally just keep that off my plate the damning evidence mounts up the judge announces that albert hicks would be hanged on friday the 13th of july 1860 hicks offered no response or reaction to the sentencing seemed to be completely passive it seemed that he thought he would get out of it somehow Mm. he'd evaded capture for years he'd evaded the law Eh, something will come up or he'll something will happen absolutely he'll be fine and so sensational was the case he was getting so much attention because he's a classic that we now see handsome man Mm. handsome oh he's so dashing and charming oh and he's a criminal everyone's fascinated (laughs) by him one person in particular was fascinated by him paid him a little visit in jail Mm. do you know who it was P.T. Barnum. Oh, very good. Yeah. Oh, yes, I did. He's got like he got like a mask. He's got like a death mask, didn't he? He did. He went to the jail. He gave Hicks money and gifts, things for his family, and mm. he said, "I want your death mask and I want your clothes. I want your suit <laughs> to put on a waxwork figure in my museum." And Hicks said, "Yeah, fine. Yeah, why I not? Yeah, go, go for it, man. <laughs> go for it." So the death mask was on the waxwork figure, mm. and he gave him his suit one of his famous suits so yeah that's where people would go and mm. see it that waxwork of hicks i think it was proclaimed to be the most evil or the most devilish man in the entire history of the universe like, that was actually the <laughs> yeah, title absolutely. it was something like that i'm not even kidding uh it survived for 10 years until it mysteriously was destroyed in a fire oh mysteriously together. now as i said hicks has been sort of arrogantly maintaining like Meh, don't even care don't even care but the day before his execution something cracks in him he's like i do care now i do care now i don't want to die <laughs> No. He asked for a priest to make his confession. He asked the priest, he said the devil had taken control of him. The devil had made him do everything. Could he still swap sides before he's hanged? Could he make his confession and would that allow him to go to heaven? No. The, well, the priest says yes. Well, our priests say a lot of stuff. But the priest says you have to confess to everything. You can't just go, oh, I recount on my deathbed. You have to confess everything. And Hicks, ever resourceful, says, okay, I will. You have to write it down. And then it is to be sold to provide for my wife and child. Because mm. he knew how sensational 
the confession would be mm-hmm. and he does he pours out his confession and that is where most of the context of this story comes from his own confession which was taken and embellished and twisted yeah, by many perfect. authors over the years but the the bones of it actually have been picked up by by many great researchers so yes this is where we get the details of all the crime and what nice. happened on the boat mm-hmm. he's very proud of that hicks went to the gallows of course impeccably dressed well one would hope he was wearing an electric blue suit nice yeah nice some people think have said that pt barnum arranged it that he he gave him the suit or he made it for him or that hicks commissioned it and Mm. other loads of people would have paid for it but basically he was able to get the suit electric blue suit he had anchor motifs sewn into the lapels (laughs) nice yeah wearing his hat as well he went up to the gallows looking very very dashing very dashing indeed. and he was hanged on what was known then as bedlow island now liberty island and about ten thousand people apparently watched from boats around the island. <laughs> I'm thinking like they probably shipped people out on like kind of the ferries and things rather than a few like all these people in a rowboat like his last words to the hangman were simply hang me quick make haste that's fair enough you don't want his last really do you no indeed it was said that after he was hanged and when he was buried his body was stolen it was grave robbed mm-hmm. and that his remains were sold to medical students at Columbia University. Nice. Okay. But sadly, no one knows what happened oh. to his fabulous suit and hat. <laughs> Barnum got a few of them. He, got... <laughs> he didn't get his death he didn't suit. Get the, he didn't get the death he, no suit. No one got the, the death suit. suit. Death. No one, no one mm. knows what happened to there's, the death there's suit. There's some medical student in Columbia going around. Going, oh, look, I look very fancy. <laughs> like just swinging a pocket watch and a zoot suit. Like da, 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 da. But there you go. That is the story of Albert Hicks, That's Last a... Pirate of New York. Good story. Last Pirate of New York. That's a good title to have. I mean, I think there were many other pirates in New York after that, but he was... Yeah, but he's got... He, he's, he now the, the name. Yeah. And last so. public um, execution. Mm. Yes. On um, boats. Sorry. On boats. What? No, he wasn't. He wasn't hanged on a boat. No, but everyone wanted to see him on a boat. Everyone the pub, the to see public him on was boat. on a boat. <laughs> All of New York rowed out. Uh, rowed out there with a nice picnic. Families going. Where are we going, mother? Oh, we're just having a day on the sea. What should we see? Oh, you just wait, love. Well, uh, we're going out to watch an <laughs> watch an execution. Then we're going to hunt some oysters. It's great. <laughs> Did you bring your harpoon? Did little you Johnny? bring your harpoon, little Johnny? <laughs> get his suit. Get his suit. <laughs> but there you go. Yeah, there's lots of. I don't know if it's theories, opinions about did Albert Hicks or was Albert Hicks the first gangster of New York? Like the gangster in terms of the style. Yes. Because a gangster is a landlocked pirate. But yeah, having the amazing suit, the fashion, the hat that we now associate with gangsters, we think they're mm. effectively turned out. Uh, I'm a little bit dubious about I'm that. I'm not entirely convinced by that, but um, no. he certainly obviously made it his calling card. Sort of, he had his, his reputation that he mm. built up to be there but I can't imagine he was the first all the other pirates and gangsters just wore rags <laughs> terribly turned out and he was like no you can be no, crazy and, can just... and still look fabulous absolutely here's my tailor <laughs> <laughs> he probably did have a tailor I'm, I'm no doubt he did absolutely yeah. not many shops you could go to and go I want a off the peg sort of fancy <laughs> electric blue suit <laughs> <laughs> I wish there should there were. be someday, someday in his honour. We named in his honour of this horrific <laughs> murderer. Yeah, it's an interesting story, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. I like it. A lot, as I said, a lot of the his past is from his own confession. Mm. I, I do believe that he went whaling and that he went on ships and then would steal and murder his way out yeah. of any kind of honest work that he had to do. <laughs> Maybe some of it is embellished by him in the last days, where he's like, "Oh, it's my confession. Great, I can really build this up." <laughs> exactly. I, I can really make this. Well, I suppose the more he builds it up the more extravagant it is the more money it's going to get sold for and then mm. I suppose the, then the better off his wife and child are so indeed it's, it's in his interest to yeah big it up a bit and and it was a sensational story yeah. you know there's not a lot of stories that involve a ghost ship covered in blood this is true well what <laughs> do you think people what do you think about albert hicks do you know the story do you know more folklore around it what do you think of pirates versus gangsters who would win in a fight <laughs> Swashbucklers or 50s ones, or we've got now in the, right in the middle, the 1800s pirates. Who would I think, win? I'm thinking like Swashbuckler and then an Uzi. <laughs> so I, I've, got, I've got a feeling who's going to win. Well, I've, or Cannon. See, this, cannon. This, this say Cannon. Maybe this is another thing that Patreon, I need to get, my, get myself my Cannon. So you can we, test. So we can test this pirates versus gangsters <laughs> with a pirate cannon. Whereas in the 1800s, it was kind of, we can have a cannon, we've got guns, maybe, but also swords. Oh, axes, they're good. <laughs> See, I prefer a cannon, to be honest. 
Because we get quite far away. <laughs> I'm not much of a close-up sort of person. Yeah, but they're not exactly precise if it's you're just trying to kill one person. Well... You, you need them to stand in the exact spot for a while. For a while. Shouting across the seas. Stay still. Why? Trust me. But then you wouldn't have to hit them directly. If you were like a couple of foot out, I think you're probably going to kill them anyway. Or so. sink the ship and then mostly yeah, it was to sink the ship and then they'd all drown. Yeah, so it's fine. I'll still go with cannon. I'll still go with cannon yeah. in the streets of Canterbury. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Showing your disgust at everything. <laughs> Cannon! Only girls fight with swords. <laughs> well, yes, what do you think, people? What do you think about Cannon? Should there have been more Cannons in this story? Sure Jump on the comments of the social media posts, come and talk to us in DMs, and if you haven't already, join us on Patreon. Indeed. And give the French Pearl a go. I've knocked back two. It's delightful. <laughs> Might have another one. You really have knocked yeah, back two. absolutely. And it's the absinthe. It's going to... Oh, you're going to be crazy. Absinthe, it's, it's always... It's fun. <laughs> So the recipe will be out on Friday. So, yeah, let us know what you think. Now, should we do a prairie oyster? I'm not. You can if you want. I'm gonna, I think I might try it after this recording. <laughs> and if it goes down well, then we will, of course, share it with you on social media. But give the French Pearl a go if you're an absinthe fan. If you have some kicking around the house, then why not? Even if you don't, forget the absinthe. Just sugar, mint and gin. Not wrong with that either, so <laughs> have at it. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh.